Something very novel and start early. Looks like there's a good number of people here. <clears throat> How about this? We kept the schedule so people that had questions couldn't ask questions. For eight minutes we could take some questions. Yes. Do we have a portable microphone? I have two questions. Hmm. Uh, one from yesterday's lecture. Uh, there were, on one side, there were two words spiritual insight. Uh, I've not seen that a lot. I've seen spiritual realizations and so on. So, was that referring to a particular insight or is it in general? I don't recall that specific reference, but it, it sounds general. So this was the slide uh, where you had Jiva Goswami's quote, and the first line was, those who lack spiritual insight. Oh, that's, that, that's Vishwanath's translation of the verse. And it's speaking general, not specific. Okay. You know, it, it's buddhi, or intelligence, because in the commentary it's intelligence, spiritual insight, bodhi, general. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question was from today's class. Uh, Mother Suniti's example is so nice. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm think, thinking about the dynamic between her and Dhruv Maharaj. And this happened in Satyavra between two great souls. What, uh, what can we take from that and how do we not imitate that and what can we take from that interaction and bring it down to today's level? Okay, right? well, it, it, that's pretty simple. It, during the during one presentation this weekend, I discussed the same part one. I forget where I was. I, oh, I know where I was. The, the um, Bergen County ESCON program on Sunday. We are not to imitate. <clears throat> We're not Suniti. What we can take from it is According to her capacity, so according to our capacity, we point to higher principles. Higher principles that we believe in, and in our case, most likely we're striving towards, and we point towards those. And with self-honesty, we may or may not explicitly say, I'm not there yet, but this is a higher principle that I have conviction in and I'm striving towards. And it will be, it'll be very helpful for me and for those dear to me to hold in high regard those same principles. Now, those principles can be mode of goodness principles, as opposed to what we're going to hear today, you know, this chapter, is the, the, the modes of nature principles, spoken by Narada, avoid them, try, try to not indulge in them, I should say, and um, go for the mode of goodness principle, because he's going to speak mode of goodness principles or a transcendental principle or combination. So that, that's, that's the practical application for us to take away from Suditi's pure devotee capacity and imparting pure devotion message 
to her son. It's part of the response as opposed to react. We take shelter of higher principles and we encourage others to take shelter of higher principles. According to our position and their position, we need to know the person who we're speaking to. It could be, you know, somebody at a public program or it could be, you know, your spouse or your child or it could be, a, you know, so it depends on the audience and the time, place, circumstance, but the principle is point, move towards elevation of consciousness principles. But the language that I use in, when I'm speaking with college students is the place of higher consciousness. And move towards that. Accept things that help you move towards the place of higher consciousness. <laughs> and watch out for the ones that go take you in the other direction. Try to refrain from them, don't indulge in them. Because they lead to more negative consciousness and negative emotions and turmoil. Right? One other question, and we have to. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, principle of acceptance as embodied by Suniti uh, and not to avenge something that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard for someone with a Kshatriya mentality to, to not respond, especially. Respond not, doesn't. Respond and accept doesn't mean. You're, you put your hands up and say, I surrender. You may take action. It may be this and that and the other thing, but it's from the place of responding, not a place of reacting or retaliating. Accepting doesn't mean do nothing. Does that help? Yes. Okay, so I, I'm, hold your question because I'm sure it's a good one. And we're just going to move on because this acceptance topic is repeated, no surprise, by Narada because he's also a pure devotee. And it's a pure, it's a mode of goodness ethic or value, but it plays its way into the life of devotion. Can we turn the light out and we'll carry on. Okay, so we ended with text 24, so we're gonna start with text 25. And um, text 24 ended with Dhruva deciding after contemplating, carefully considering, accepting the instruction of his mother, he left the palace, he left home, went into the forest. And um, now we're going to hear several things, but one of the, the main showcase pieces is the determination of Dhruva. Now, in the past few weeks, when speaking on this topic and asked the question, in one word, when you think of Dhruva, what do you think of? And it's determination. So, outstanding characteristic of Dhruva is determination. And even it's not advisable determination, like, you know, he, he's not, he's plowing right ahead, not receiving the instruction of his good mother, not receiving the instruction of Narada, plowing right ahead because he's got a determination that's mixed. And he regrets that later. Very, very determined. Uh, a, a, cla <coughs> excuse me, a classic example of this determination is found right in Bhagavad Gita chapter 6, where the yoga process, the dhyana yoga process in chapter 6, 
speaks of Nishayena, the same dato is there in Rupa Goswami's writings, Utsahan Nishchayat Dayayat, Nishchayat, same root, verbal root, with firm determination and the way that Prabhupada describes in his Bhaktivedanta purports, Bhagavad Gita, that little sparrow. Now, the sparrow did boo-boo. Wasn't the sea's fault. She laid her eggs by the shore of the sea. And the tide came in and the eggs went out to sea. It's not the sea's fault. But when the sparrow demanded, return my eggs, you know, the sea didn't respond. So then, with determination, she took a vow. Dread of Rata, I'm going to dry up the sea with my little beak. And the way the story is narrated, uh, word spread. Wow. The sparrow's trying to dry up the ocean. <laughs> so Gruta heard, and Gruta came, heard from the sparrow <coughs> what happened, and took compassion upon the sparrow and said, let me help you. And then turned to the sea and said, you better return the eggs or I'm going to dry you up. And then the sea said, uh-oh, I better return the eggs. So the sea wasn't responding to the sparrow, but the sea responded to Garuda and the eggs were returned and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> when one is very determined, it's not our own determination. This is going to be the evening's class. Our determination alone is not enough. Prayasa alone is not enough. Even if you're Mother Jasoda, you can't bind Krishna unless something else happens in Krishna's mercy is required but God helps those who help themselves is Prabhupada's statement so he Dhruva has this firm determination and that's what we're going to hear about so he has this determination he's gone to the forest and he's searching for Vishnu and he doesn't find Vishnu because he doesn't have a guru because you can't find Vishnu without a guru he finds animals and birds and snakes and trees and forest life no Vishnu but he's very determined to find Vishnu because that's what his mom said he find Vishnu in the forest so um, the Bhagavatam says, the great sage Narada overheard this news. Now it doesn't say who he heard it from, but it became like talk, like, hey, the sparrow wants to draw up the ocean. So he heard. Super soul arranged for him to hear. And understanding the activities of Dhruva Maharaj, he was struck with wonder. He approached Dhruva and touching the boy's head with his all virtuous hand he spoke as follows so this is text 25 and this little image shows the Sanskrit for this Agha Nena Panani Agha we know what that means it means sin and Sin or sinful activity is driven away by panani, panana, panina, excuse me, the virtuous hand, the all virtuous hand. There's a similar reference <coughs> found in the fifth, the sixth canto of Bhagavatam. Uh, Narada Muni, whose merciful glance never goes in vain where Narada Muni has delivered the Haryashvas and then the Savalashvas at Narayana Saras. And 
It's just his, his merciful glance is sufficient. I mean, there were things that were done after the glance, but his merciful glance is very powerful. As the glance of Krishna is very powerful, the glance of the pure devotee is also powerful. Prabhupada writes, any gesture of the spiritual master awakens the desire to connect with and serve Krishna. This is a function. The power for that function is invested by Krishna. Krishna Shakti, Vina Nahitara Pravartana, Chaitanya Charitamrita. One cannot do such a function without empowerment. With empowerment, then such a function becomes possible. Even a gesture, so Narada's gesture of touching the head of Dhruva, very benedictory. In the purport, further is explained, Narada is Kala Gya. He is so powerful that he can understand the past, future, and present of everyone's heart. Just like the Super Soul, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now we know that two things. Vyasa Dev is another such person. Trikalagya. Narada is another such person. So if he's Trikalagya, why did he have to wait to hear? He heard, drove us off in the forest. He could just be Trikalagya and go, zoom, there's It's just described shortly, within the heart of Narada, Super Soul was there, and Super Soul prompted him, Super Soul prompted someone to tell him. One time somebody asked Srila Prabhupada, uh, it is said <coughs> that <coughs> one who knows Krishna becomes the knower of everything. So are you omniscient? Someone asked like that. And Prabhupada's answer was really cool. He said, I know what Krishna needs me to know, that much I know. So how does Krishna impart to someone who needs to know what they need to know? However Krishna wants to do it, that's how. And it can be through someone. But it's super soul prompting that someone to tell Narada, hey, the son of Uttanapada is off in the forest. It doesn't have to be like close his eyes and he can like see everything past, present, and future. It, it, if Krishna wants like that, it can be like that. So we should not, with language, confine Krishna. It's got to be like this, it can't be like that. Krishna is not limited by our tiny brain or imagination. Second is, although he's Sri Kalagya, that is, he knows the heart of, Nar of Dhruva, He's going to similarly examine the heart of Dhruva. He's going to test and examine his determination. Like we read in Nectar of Instruction, text number five. The spiritual master is to examine the disciple. So he's going to be the spiritual master of Dhruva. He's not yet. But he's doing what spiritual masters should do. He's examining the student. And he gets a really clear answer from that examination, along with his trikalagya. So remember, it, it says here, he can understand the past, present, and future, past, future, and present of everyone's heart. Still he's examining. Prabhupada's purport <coughs> to that first verse. 
The Supreme Personality of Godhead is present in everyone's heart. And as soon as he, that's Krishna, understands that a living entity is serious about entering devotional service, he sends his representative. In this way, Narada was sent to Dhruva Maharaj. So this is our Guru Krishna Prasadi by Bhakti Lata Beach. Message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So now we're going to have a little exercise, writing exercise. So get your pen and your pad or your however you want to take notes. And so clear your mind, literally, please. You can leave your eyes open or closed, whatever you like, but literally take a few breaths. And then I'm going to make some suggestion. Go internally and connect with your heart. Think of an incident or some special moment in your life where you tangibly perceived or felt within your heart the saving grace of Srila Prabhupada. or your spiritual master. Write it down when you're ready. Take a few moments, write it down. One more minute, please. I only see a few people looking up, which is a sign that you're finished. S several are still writing. That's a good sign. You're taking it seriously, this exercise. Um, What's at the bottom of the slide says, 
Remind yourself of these cherished gifts every day and certainly at times of facing obstacles when engaging in the bhakti process. So I, what I'm going to encourage is when we're done, turn to a person close by you or next to you or whatever and you share with them and they share with you so you can share what your experience was and what you felt when that experience happened. It's to take the message and bring it internal. How's that? At the end when we finish questions answers. Remind me if I forget. So, it, um, sometimes you may be asked What's your favorite sections of Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam? And my answer to that is, one of them is, where there's descriptions of what's going on inside Krishna's heart or inside a pure devotee's heart. It's like really confidential. What's going inside? It's, it's, it's advised scripturally, don't, Prabhupada's words, don't predicate the mind of the spiritual master. It's very risky. It, it, it can easily, it's speculation and it can easily lead to misunderstanding and offense. So when scriptures disclose, what are the thoughts of a pure devotee in this circumstance? Wow, that's really confidential. So like an, a nice example is when Narda is confronted with Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva. What are his contemplations? Not just what he does and says, but before he does and says, what are his contemplations? It's really amazing. Read it with like confidential disclosure. So here's just one sentence, one verse. Narda is seeing the situation. He finds Dhruva, he touches Dhruva on the head, he hasn't spoken yet, and he's contemplating. Little graphic here. He's been insulted, so he knows. Dhruva didn't say, but he knows why he's in the forest. So the contemplation of Narada, how wonderful are the powerful Chatriyas. They cannot tolerate even a slight infringement upon their prestige. Just imagine, this boy is only a small child, yet harsh words from his stepmother proved unbearable to him. So he knows his heart. Now he's going to speak. My dear boy, you're only a little boy whose attachment is to sports and other frivolities. Why are you so affected by words insulting your honor? You little boy. No response. My dear Drova, if you feel that your sense of honor has been insulted, you still have no cause for dissatisfaction. Why? This kind of dissatisfaction is another feature of the illusory energy. Every living entity is controlled by his previous actions and therefore there are different varieties of life for enjoying and suffering. His mother said the same thing. He's using different words, more detailed and definitive. But when something comes your way that causes some pain, some hurt feeling, he's using here dissatisfaction. It's just the fruit of your previous actions. And different people are in different situations because of different karma. And sometimes when that dissatisfaction comes, 
We don't take it as, hey, that's my karma, it's, it's, I'm getting what I deserve. And this dissatisfaction is due to the illusory energy. There's many things the illusory energy does, but it covers the consciousness of the living entity so they can't see what's what. Instead, they see something and then they feel, in this case, dissatisfaction. Illusory energy, feeling. So here's a little teaching that's not so dissimilar, but it's just furthering in the story form, the Puranic form, Bhagavad Gita's message. Interesting way of saying it. What comes at us in our life depends on our karma and how we respond to that is influenced by our guna. The free will choices are influenced by guna. So attend to your guna, <laughs> your qualities. Different situations and different responses. And there's different, so there's variety in this world, that's the gunas. So it's a nice way of thinking of it. What comes at you is your karma and how you respond is your guna. Dissatisfaction, that's how you respond. That's just another feature of illusion. Our current body, gross and subtle, is a product of past karma. That's what we get from our past activity. The enjoyments and sufferings in this present body, they're also products of our karma. You know, the good fortune, ill fortune, or whatever it is. How we respond is another thing. Attachment to one's karmic bonds keeps us in illusion. And thus we're perpetually dissatisfied. Nice teaching. Dhruva's teaching his student and he's examining his responses. So this is, and when you see this pink slide that means it's a reflection or a action, the activity. Has being dissatisfied ever made you feel satisfied? Or uh, one devotee has this on his WhatsApp photo. Um, that's a photograph of Srila Prabhupada walking early in the morning in Moscow from the Red Square, if you recognize the photograph. And this other message is, it's a trendy message. People that aren't devotees understand this, the, the counselor people. Remove expectation from people and you'll remove their power to hurt your feelings. Let's we'll say it the other way. If you have an expectation of other people and they don't meet your expectation, you'll feel something. So what's a life where there's no expectation? Well, there's one thing you can expect and that's Krishna is very kind. And then the rest is your karma and what's next, who knows? And there, there's another teaching that has to do with overcoming negative emotion. Those of you that came to the um, Beer Krishnamars' seminar on empathic communication will know this one, but it's an important one because it's so important we, we covered it twice, two different Memorial Day weekend retreats, A and B, A, your existence is to fulfill my needs. Ah. <laughs> You're, you put yourself in a prison or in a cage by thinking like that. The existence of other people is not to fulfill your needs. But supposing the freedom is, 
I have my needs and I need to, it's, it's, it's a requirement of me to find a strategy that meets my needs. And I should, and, and to be responsible, I should consider others' needs as I'm fulfilling my needs. You don't just knock people out of the way because I got my needs and I'm fulfilling them. Look out, here I come. But responsible life is I know what my needs are. I'm in a thoughtful way, finding a way to making a strategy to take care of my needs and respectfully understanding other people's needs and honoring their needs as I'm moving forward with taking care of mine. And then there's a, a wholesome relationship. If we want wholesome relationships, that's a key. So whether it's a family member or a mother-in-law or a spouse or you know a friend or a community member or somebody out there, their existence is not to fulfill my needs. And if I hold that expectation, then I'm opening the door for, please come in and hurt me. I mean, there, there's a, there are other ways of saying the same thing. This is one. I could say it some other ways, but Bhakti Siddhanta has another way of saying the same thing. It says the same thing. No one can hurt you unless you inv invite them in to hurt you. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have relationships. We have relationships. And it, having relationships means sometimes and sometimes. Supposing you're, you know, frustrated, then you, you don't want to have relationships. You become an impersonalist. Because I don't want to have any hurt. In relationships, sometimes it hurts, and so I don't want relationships. It's, it's, a, it's a very curious topic of how we navigate our way through the world of duality. And if you're not a devotee, if you don't have shelter and transcendence, it's misery. Take your pick. Misery or misery or misery. <laughs> Varieties of misery. <laughs> Even when things go well, it's just inviting misery because you're buying into duality. And the misery is going to come, guaranteed. And if you're not a devotee, then you, you, know, you become an existentialist or an impersonalist or a voidist or a check out or... And people knock on your door and you're, you, you know, nobody's home. <laughs> and you knock on other people's door and the voice on the other side of the door says, nobody's home. <laughs> Checked out. All the lonely people, where have they come from? There's a song like that. Where do they belong? So, we, anyway, so the, the, the bhakti message, here Narada is delivering, he's it's giving transcendental knowledge to Dhruva. He hasn't gone to bhakti yet. He will. So, in the purport of this verse, Prabhupada, speaks about the Brahma Bhuta verse, naturally, neither hankering or lamenting. That's the spiritual position. When one is situated in the transcendental platform, nothing for which to hanker, nothing for which to lament. Here's the pyramid at the bottom of lots of hankering and it's, net and it's dark. And then above that is Rajas and above that is tam and Sattva, and then there's transcendence. So he, he, Narada is pointing towards transcendence. Dhruva isn't ready to go there. But he's examining Dhruva. So he says, the next verse, the process, this you know, reward and punishment you could say, the process of the external energy is very wonderful. One who is intelligent, that's this bhuti message again, should accept that process and be satisfied with whatever comes, favorable or unfavorable, 
Now, Bhagavad Gita chapter two is you tolerate the favorable and unfavorable. Narada's teaching, you accept it. You accept the process and whatever comes through the process. We're in the material world. We wanted enjoyment separate from Krishna and it was a bad choice. So here we are. So we accept the process of sometimes and sometimes. The process of duality, just because it, that's what it is. And take shelter of transcendence. That's the intelligent person. Here's Vishwanath's rendering of this verse. One by intelligence should be satisfied with whatever amount, tavan, matrena, matrena is senses contacting sense objects, tavan, matrena, whatever amount of happiness or distress is, because that's what happiness and distress is, is sense contact and how the mind reads it. I was thinking, it's, it's getting a little warmer here, but I've, I've, wherever I was previously, I can't even remember, it was really cold. And uh, the, the person had set the thermostat in such a way, it was cold air blowing through the, the heating system, you know. And I was thinking, gosh, if it was summer, that would be fantastic. <laughs> But now I'm reading it as, oh no, can you fix the thermostat? It's just sense perception. Exactly what Krishna says. The happiness and distress, it just arises from sense perception. One should learn to tolerate. Now it's here, an intelligent person not only tolerates, but just accepts it. Now you may do something when you accept it, Turn thermostat, but you don't have to feel the stress. Oh gosh. Whatever amount of happiness and distress is attained by one's own actions in previous lives, understanding that karma produces the results under the direction of the Lord. Ishvara Gatim. So everything is happening under the Lord's direction. Prabhupada refers to this verse more often than the, the, the one we just are looking at here, fourth canto, chapter eight, karmana daivane trena. Anyone that's heard Prabhupada lectures knows the phrase. Karmana daivane trena. Everything is happening by divine arrangement. Good, bad, in the mix. And now comes another message in this section. Narada's instructions to Dhruva include a life of responsibility and it's a sign of intelligence. Bhuti, that you accept responsibility for what's coming your way because you were responsible. We made some past choices and here comes the consequence of our past choices. Taking responsibility results in responsible responses. If I'm responsible for what's coming my way, then I can respond in a responsible way to what's coming my way. If I don't take responsibility, then I start blaming. Or feeling ashamed, or feeling something, victimized. Victim consciousness, and then what happens to the victim consciousness? The victim becomes the perpetrator. That's the usual pattern. Just. And so life goes on. This cycle of birth and death goes on. Now we're going to have a little exercise. You get some time to discuss with somebody sitting next to you. Um, some situation where some misfortune came your way and you accept it that this misfortune is the fruit of some unknown past misdeed for which you accepted full responsibility and you processed the emotions 
of that misfortune in a responsible manner. Not like change the situation, but process the emotions. Read it a few times when you're ready, find somebody nearby you and share. Don't take too long. <laughs> Twos is best, and if threes, if that works better for you, that's fine.
Try to finish up one more minute. We're ready to move forward. Are we ready to move forward? I hope. Um, <clears throat> at the end, you'll have some more time to share if you didn't finish because there's a little exercise I asked you to do at the end and that is where you felt some saving grace from Prabhupada or your spiritual master, some fortunate special mercy came. So you can take more time on this one at, at the end after questions, answers, if you like. So now we're back with Dhruva, who's being examined by Narada, and he was to test his determination. There's a crack in the cement or pavement and a little plant is growing there against all odds. So how determined is that little plant to keep growing and keep growing? So Dhruva has some determination. So Narada gives, he hasn't responded positively yet you know, give up envy, accept the, your own misfortune, don't become situated in disappointment and illusion. He's got a blank look on his face. Hmm. So he's going to give him some uh, negative, you know, give up this idea kind of messages. Such austerities are not possible for an ordinary person, even an adult. Very difficult to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Many sages have tried for many births, through many types of austerities, but were not successful in finding the Lord. He's still looking at him with a blank look. You're too young. Go back. Stay in the palace for some time when you grow up. And then you can try. Basically, give up, go home, grow up. <laughs> He's looking at him with a blank look. <laughs> then he tries, you know, a higher principle that he's not ready for. It's transcendental knowledge, but it bounces. One should try to keep himself satisfied in any condition of life. 
whether distress or happiness, which is offered by the Supreme Will. He's kind of said that earlier. The, this process of the Supreme Lord is wonderful. Just accept it. A person who endures in this way is able to cross over the darkness of nescience very easily. Comments from our acharyas. The key to surpass samsara is acceptance, the current condition, and remain determined to move into Krishna consciousness. Vishwanath says, satisfying himself amidst happiness and distress with these experiences which are given to him by karma, the embodied person surpasses samsara. This is liberation talk. Dhruva doesn't want liberation, he wants a kingdom. He wants revenge. This idea that Narada is speaking, this happiness and distress acceptance given by our own karma is similar to the message I was sharing before. So here's an image. This is a stress management 101 principle. I, I learned this from Braja Bihari who shared with me the presentation that he was doing when he was living in India. He was um, being paid to go to corporate places in India and teach stress management. And one of the principles goes like this. Life throws rocks at you and it hurts. So then there's the react and there's the respond. So the advice, I mentioned this, just doing this with a visual image because it's important. You take the rock and you throw it up in the air. So the situation is what it is. I'm feeling what I'm feeling. And I'm not gonna just get in this impulsive reaction mode. I'm gonna be in this mode of goodness space and consider what just happened, the feelings that I'm feeling, and what are my options. Not only with the rock that's in your hand, that's, you know, it hurts, and the circumstance that's outside of your control, but what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do with who I am, I'm making a, I'm going to make free will choices, not guna-driven choices. The lower modes, generally of it happens when it hurts, not the higher modes. So I'm not gonna go through it again, I'm just gonna do it quickly, but this is that acceptance message. Once again, acceptance is the key to handling life well. And what Narda is saying is acceptance is the principle for peaceful life if you want peaceful life, then you have to accept the circumstances that are out of your control. And accepting circumstances one more time doesn't mean you do nothing, but the circumstances are what the circumstances are. You just accept that's what they are. It's raining or it's cold or something. I, you know, I have a bad knee. No, I can consider, you know, a knee replacement, but you know, I got a bad knee. I'm just like, rah, 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 I got a bad knee. That's not gonna help. So now what am I gonna do about the circumstance? So here's another one, exercise after the question answer session. Um, some, situation in your life with this principle by ex by adopting the principle of acceptance something that you're addressing or might address theoretically by the principle of acceptance you can maintain internal and external balance in your devotional life with your family with your work with your life by the principle of acceptance.
So you're going to have a busy time after we're done with questions and answers. Here's Prabhupada speaking on Bhagavad Gita chapter 4. If Krishna, this is the acceptance. If Krishna gives Luchi Puri, that's also all right. And if he gives Shukha Chana, that is also all right. Yadrich Chaya Labha Santushtaha. Because we are depending on Krishna, whatever Krishna gives, we should be satisfied. We should never be dissatisfied. That's this dissatisfaction that Dhruva was feeling. We should never be dissatisfied. Oh, Krishna today is giving me only Shukachana. No, whatever Krishna gives, that is devotee. Yadrich Chaya Labha Santushta. Dvandva Tita, no enviousness. So, one more verse of Narada's instructions to Dhruva. Now, this is a little on the theme, a little off the theme, but it's a theme in the Bhagavatam, so Dhruva speaks it. Every man should act like this. When he meets a person more qualified than himself, he should be very pleased. When he meets someone less qualified than himself, he should be compassionate toward him. And when he meets someone equal to himself, he should make friendship with him in this way, but is never affected by the threefold miseries of this material world. This is this acceptance principle. That's how it's connected. But this is the Madhyama position, elaborated elsewhere in the Bhagavatam many times, and Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's the Madhyama Adhikari position. So now, hmm, there was, goes the question mark. How does a person with material consciousness look at the three levels of relationships? Different than what Narada advised. Someone who's more qualified, so a person in material consciousness, envious. This is this destructive principle. One who is less qualified, deride them, push them down. One who is equal, pride and compete. So go to the spiritual side. He's giving spiritual guidance. Okay, now here's Dhruva's response, and then we're done. It's a yeah, but. My dear Nardaji, for a person whose heart is disturbed by the material conditions of happiness and distress, whatever you have so kindly explained for attainment of peace of mind is certainly very good instruction. But as far as I am concerned, I am covered by ignorance and this kind of philosophy does not touch my heart. At the heart level, I could try to do what you're saying, but it's not me. And the instruction isn't wrong. The instruction is good. But I'm covered by ignorance, which is true. Material desire is a product of ignorance. This peacefulness of mind which you have shown by mercy, this is Vishwanath's gloss, for persons afflicted by happiness and distress is difficult for a person like me. The Bhagavad Gita's description of a mode of goodness, Brahmana, peacefulness is part of their life. But I'm not a Brahmana. So why is it, one who is not a brahmana, this peacefulness is difficult to reach? Well, it's the lower modes. That's why. And it's likened to standing on a tangled rope. Passion, hankering about 
the future happiness and ignorance lamenting over the past and being pushed and pulled by those lower modes being in the mode of goodness and being peaceful huh and then because of those modes then comes the thoughts in the mind and the desires in the mind and oh it's a very difficult struggle very difficult struggle so that's what um, Dhruva is saying this is good instruction for a devotee when you hear an instruction that is like not within your reach you feel you don't reject the instruction or the instructor he admitted he was not beyond material distress and happiness he appreciated the instruction at least on a consciousness level yet he felt for me it's not doable so there's non-enviousness towards the instructor or the instruction this is advice when you feel some instruction is not within your reach and you express the difficulty and why you have in maintaining and upholding that instruction and seek purification in a way that's matching your capacity now at the bottom left corner says acceptance and progress and that's uh, another whole weekend in Memorial Day weekend we spent in Gita Nagri on that theme acceptance meaning self-honesty not self-delusion this is where I am to yourself and in your dealings with others don't project knowing that I'm way down here but I want others to accept me so I project I'm somewhere where I'm not so just self-acceptance and acceptance in your position in relationships with others and progress I want to go further towards this value this goal that I feel is worthy it's a place of virtue that I wish to attain and I'm not there yet then you can progress and I require purification of heart in order to progress so that's what Dhruva is saying basically I'm very impudent for not accepting your instructions he points to two reasons why it's not my fault it's due to my having been born in a Kshatriya family my st and then the other my stepmother Saruji has pierced my heart with her harsh words therefore your valuable instruction does not stand in my heart he said that was the first statement he made now he's explaining why Vish Vishwanath says it this way though you have given this nectar of peacefulness out of your mercy for an unqualified person like me my heart has been pierced and thus is like a broken pot therefore your instructions do not stay there my heart's been broken now that's on the material side but that's his position it's material spiritual next verse we're almost done oh learned Brahmana I want to occupy a position more exalted than any yet achieved within the three worlds by anyone even my fathers and grandfathers if you will oblige kindly advise me of an honest path it's sadhu vartama to follow by which I can achieve the goal of my life Vishwanath says tell me the correct method for attaining a position unattained by my father Uttanapada who insulted me 
by his father, Manu, by his father, Brahma, and by Brahma's other sons and grandsons, please advise me. The honest path, Sadhu Vartma. We, you know, we, we heard this word Vartma a little while ago, Vartma Pradarshaka Guru, that's what Suniti was doing. So he wants this now, Sadhu Vartma. She indicated and he's asking again for Narada to give him the details of that process. Prabhupada's comment here is he doesn't want by hook or crook, he wants by honest means, that is only if Krishna offers it. So he's an ethical and conscious young boy. And where did he get that? He got it from his mother plus his own, his own quality like that. Oh my Lord, oh my dear Lord, you are a worthy son of Lord Brahma and you travel playing on your musical instrument, the Veena, for the welfare of the entire universe. You are like the sun which rotates in the universe for the benefit of all living beings. So he wants some of that mercy for himself. Purport, Prabhupada's purport. The example of the sun is very significant. The sun is so kind that he distributes his sunshine everywhere without consideration. Dhruva Maharaj requests Narada Muni to be merciful to him. He pointed out that Narada travels all over the universe just for the purpose of doing good for all conditioned souls. He requested that Narada Muni show his mercy by awarding him the benefit of his particular desire. <coughs> now another nice saying, acceptance of our current spiritual level brings humility. Humility gives courage. Courage gives determination to progress in the path towards a goal and the correct path and goal are repeatedly shown only by a bona fide spiritual master. So the disciple and spiritual master are getting to understand one another. Now this is our last slide. Supposing you become so determined, then what? Will you feel capable to achieve the Lord or receive the Lord? That's our next topic. See you tonight. Still chapter eight. We haven't gotten out of chapter eight yet. Okay, so turn on the lights if you would back there and see if there's some more discussion. <coughs> Sure. The, the, this isn't verbatim, this is my memory. A Vaishnava will never engage in fault finding for by so doing, he's only indicating that his own heart is honeycombed with the very same fault. So, supposing somebody is pure hearted. They can discern. It's not that a pure devotee takes the intelligence and turns it into the opposition and can't see what's what. The devotee is discerning. They can see what's what, but they don't fault find. Because fault find is a criticism, a judgment. 
not just discerning, but a judgment. You're guilty. And round, 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 round. Some, you know, negative energy going towards that person who has a flaw. Doing the fault finding shows that very same fault is in my heart. That's why I'm fault finding. That's what, that's what his teaching says. So let's do it differently, the, the opposite. One of my favorite passages of Chaitanya Charitamrita is when <clears throat> Krishna Das Kaviraj has received a request to write Chaitanya Charitamrita and he doesn't feel himself qualified. <coughs> but he's getting an instruction or request from some of Lord Chaitanya's devotees to write it. <laughs> At least he's asking. <coughs> so, um, he goes here and there and asks senior Vaishnavas. So, Haridas Pandit is one of those persons he goes to. And Haridas Pandit is a grand disciple of Gadadhar Pandit. And he's a pujari of Govindaji. And he's an eloquent speaker of Bhagavatam. And so when, he, when, when Krishna Das goes to him, it's described in Chaitanya Charitamrita what he was of the, the, the type of person that no one would ever speak anything bad. They would not do any fault finding in the presence of Haridas. And then the commentary is too, very short, but Prabhupada writes, everyone in this world has quality and fault, guna and dosha. Haridas could see what's what, but he never went to the dosha part and said, look at that, and look at that, and look at that. He was not fault finding, although he could see, he would speak and encourage the quality in the devotee and devotees. Not that he couldn't see. So there's a distinction between discerning and fault finding. Fault finding shows that one's own heart is honeycombed with that fault. And when one's heart is free from that fault, he won't fault find, although he'll be able to discern what's what. Instead, when that discerning capacity goes on, a Vaishnava is one who looks inside. Is this quality, is this dosha within me? To what degree, in what way might it be in me? And it's like reflex. That's how, it, that's how a Vaishnava, Bhakti Siddhanta's writing says that's how a Vaishnava thinks. That's his contemplation when he sees. Does that answer your question? Practically, how do we do it? Without a heart that's pure, we can't do it. We cultivate it. So, don't, here's the do not is don't shut your intelligence off. Bhagavad Gita teaches us to discern. Let's say, the modes of nature look like this. The mode of happiness, the mode of goodness, the mode of passion. You know, it's going to be happiness in the mode of goodness, passion, ignorance. So, we discern. We're advised to do that. Practically, we, we learn how to see things through the eyes of Scripture. Krishna's words. See things as Krishna sees them. And we're advised to not criticize this or that or the other. We just, we discern and then we act in an appropriate manner according to that discerning. And we cultivate on the strength of bhakti. Bhakti strength is we want to please Krishna. That's the operative principle. That's the bhakti principle. That's how we, so we cultivate pleasing Krishna and pleasing Krishna and pleasing Krishna and becomes our way of life. Pleasing Krishna becomes our way of life. 
while the intelligence is discerning. What's the best way to please Krishna in this circumstance, that circumstance? Bodhi and Bhakti go together and cultivate. Someone else had their hand up? In the back? Well, it's a mind. so what, what the orient the orientation of your mind is a product of karma, guna and karma. So is there a connection between uh, sense perception and the mind also? Yes, sure, and and you know so the the situation itself is not distress. The the, the cold air blowing through the the heating and air conditioning system is not in itself, it's how I'm perceiving it. That's the sense perception, it's called air. How am I perceiving it? That's the mind. The senses send information to the mind and the mind reads it. Well, this is, this is a it's how you read it, the mind says. But supposing, su supposing somebody's from the Arctic and there's cold air blowing into the, <laughs> the system, they're gonna go, wow, that's nice. And you know, for somebody that's from South India, you know, they, they, you know, when it's really hot, it's like, wow, that's comfortable. So, yes, it's the mind, but then what's behind the mind? Why do we have this mind instead of that mind or the other mind? The gross and subtle bodies are awarded by our karma and the configuration of them. It's a combination of guna and karma. So you could say it's the modes of nature. You could say it's the mind. You could say it's my advice is don't look at the big picture and don't get stuck on one phrase. If you like the idea, it's scriptural, it's the mind. That's what's reading happiness or distress. And then what's behind that? And what's behind that? And what's behind that? Well, Krishna's the cause. So he's the cause. Yes. Go ahead, speak. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, my question is about what you said about the principle of acceptance. Okay. Um, so I'm just, Thinking of a practical situation today, for example, a work situation or a situation where you are unhappy at work or you have a horrible manager or boss. Um, and what I'm trying to understand is your point about accepting the situation, but at the same time not passively, uh, do, I mean, not, not really taking any action to change it. So does the, the, the point of acceptance, does that mean that you just accept it and, you know, things will change? Or no. do you actively seek out? Uh, solution. A solution. So how, how should I reconcile that? Okay. Let's just take, just keep it rather than too many things. It's notional and abstract, but I'm at work and my, 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 my boss is mean and grumpy. He can never, never be pleased. 
and he was always complaining and always pushing things on other people and so forth. Like this guy is not really somebody I want to work with. Now, and there are, there are situations like that. So now you, you know, life throws rocks at you and you're tossing it in the air. It is what it is what it is. This fellow is not likely to change. Now what are my options? I'm accepting the reality he's not likely to change. Now, is there something that I can do about this situation? What are my options? In accepting, I'm not with a straitjacket. I'm not just holding a white flag and say, you know, I surrender to being abused by an abusive person. But what are my options? And you consider your options. You eliminate some and then some are left and then you, you choose one of those options. Or maybe a couple of them and see maybe Krishna will open this door, if not that door. And meanwhile, you're in this accepting mode, but you're taking thoughtful, responsible action in relation to the situation. And until you do, you just continue to be accepting and patient until a little light goes on that says, this is a very plausible path. Maybe it's not what Krishna wants. I'm ready to take another indication or signal from Krishna that's not what he wants. Because I want to do what Krishna wants. But I, it certainly it's a given. I've accepted this, this is an you know, impossible person. Now, even in situations where the impossible person is impossible, I've had workers in the workplace describe how the situation has changed the impossible person. Changed. I mean, he still has a curved tail. <laughs> the, the, the tail got straightened a little bit, but he still, you know, got a curved tail. But the situation had, had shifted somewhat by the devotee doing this and then choosing from their heart, connecting with Krishna, a, a certain conduct and speech. And, they, and there was a response, a change response from the unchangeable, impossible supervisor. So you leave your options open when you're doing this. In that acceptance, you're making choices of how I'm, how I'm going to deal with the situation. Rather than going rah, 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 and going over there and talking to person B about person C. It doesn't change the situation. <laughs> Most likely it'll go back to person C that you're speaking about person C and it'll get worse. So. Okay. Somebody else. Yeah, up front. Put your hand up again. In our practical life, we, as a, as a father, trying to take that role on it, right, to our kids on it. How much I should be, and how much I should understand my kids on it, whether they are ready to accept those elevated, from elevated acts, like elevated things to be ready for that. Should I understand before I give them those? No, it, it's, it's, it, I, if I've understood your question correctly, 
My response would be, in any, as in any relationship, it's dynamic. That is to say, you're open and you're accepting. And as you're accepting, as best as you can understand the, the, on the receiving end, the audience, whoever that person is, family member or others, on the receiving end, their quality, their capacity, their nature is in this range. So appropriate for this range, I'm communicating, I'm sharing, I'm extending some thoughts for con consideration. And then you wait to see the response. Now, sometimes there's all kinds of possibilities of responses. Y your specific question is about a, ch uh, a young person. Sometimes, sometimes, young persons really want to see, do you really accept me? They don't say that. But they'll give a response that says, I want to see if you accept me. So they'll say back something that's going to challenge your acceptance. Mm -hmm. Oh, you wouldn't understand. You know, it's a teenage kind of, you know, oh, Dad, you'd never understand anyway, so I'm not going to, something. So now, yeah, so it's, it's dynamic. And you know, you know, what do you mean? I understand. <laughs> or, you know, whatever, you know, it, 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 the relationships are relationships. And you have to have an understanding of another person's need and what's important to them. It's one of the rules of communication. A rule goes like this. First, seek to be, to understand before seeking to be understood. You've heard that one before? I'll say it again. First seek to understand before seeking to be understood. So, if the, the other person, your son or whoever the other person is, if they see you really care about understanding them, not cosmetically, because you want buy-in for what you're going to say, so it's just a strategy. But if you really care about them and understanding them, if they feel that, they're going to be more open to share themselves. And when they're open to share themselves, it's not like a strategy, aha, now I know how to get what I want. But th then you can have an open relationship. Another way of saying the same thing is if you want a trusting relationship, be trustworthy. So be a trustworthy communicator, where you mean, I'd really like to understand what's happening. What are you feeling? Not so I can manipulate. Because that's, you know, especially with teenagers and young people, kind of, you know, don't tread on me. So, are you gonna, you, you know, what, what's your, you get the idea. So, be trustworthy, and then when you're trustworthy, you'll get a trustworthy response, and then you take that trustworthy response, an honest response, rather than a covered response, or not full disclosure response. And you don't judge, you don't react, you just, you're in a relationship with someone, in this case a you know, young person, where you're looking at the world from the same side of the table. There's the world out there. Hmm, that's what you see out there. So how can I assist you? Not just like, I want to give my values to you, and that's, then that's a 10. You, have, you know, you have to, it depends on the age and depends on the person, but you have to learn the art of helping that young person make the decisions that are 
virtuous, wise. But it has, you know, depends on the age, but it has to be their decision, not just you're deciding for them because you're the, you're the big guy, they're the little guy. So they do what you say because you're the big guy and they're the little guy, right? You know, if, that, if that's the dynamic, you may get obedience, but you're not gonna get gratitude and love. And then that's not sustainable, because when you're not around, then it's, they're exploring. What are my options? Right? And they're with their peers, and when they go off to college, and so on and so on. Who knows what's out there? So something that's sustainable is, it's, you help them make wise decisions that are virtuous and upwardly directive. What do you think? Easier said than done, right? Hmm? Okay. Another, go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Who was Ruva Maharaj in his previous life? Doesn't say. Next. Hare Krishna uh, I think I have uh, two questions. Mm. Uh, one is, uh, you mentioned uh, Narada Muni first actually tried to test the determination and his initial instructions were kind of, sounded kind of discouraging him or yeah. taking him away from the path. Not from the path, from, that, from the moment. The first was, you know, retaliation. That's not going to get you. You won't please Vishnu if you're in this get back mood. It's not pleasing to Vishnu. You have to be pleasing to Vishnu. Give it up. And, and so forth. Go ahead. Um, I my second question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I um, and when you said that Guru Maharaj was, was, when he said like, uh, your instruction doesn't pierce my heart and mm. he wants to get a kingdom like greater than his father or grandfather. Was he just reacting like... Um, yes. He was just reflecting the consciousness of the stepmother in a sense because she yes. compared... Yes. He was, you know, it, it's a lower mode of nature where that thing was coming from and quite childish. His father was not going to let him sit on, well, the stepmother wasn't going to let him sit on his father's lap, not throne. And his father said nothing. So he was insulted by both of them, as far as he was concerned. So I don't, I don't want just my father's kingdom. Better than my father's father, Swami Bhavamadu. Better than my father's father's father, that's Brahma. Better than Brahma, what's that? That's the spiritual world. It's childish. Determined. It's, you know, retaliation, lower mode of nature. That's where it was coming from. Not thoughtful, just retaliation. I'm a Kshatriya. And the, just the language that you used in your question, the words of his stepmother pierced his heart, which then broke his heart, and so the words of Narada don't stay in the broken heart, the broken, like a broken pot, doesn't hold anything. Your words are right, I don't disagree with your words. I am feeling the duality of happiness and distress, but I'm not ready for peacefulness because my heart is broken. The words don't stay there. Oh, and a kingdom. <laughs> okay? You're, oh, you're good? Okay. Microphone back there. And so there's probably something on the lady's side. How are we doing with time? It's quarter to twelve. 
Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for this wonderful uh, inspiration of the class of six courses. My question is on the uh, based on the free will and the God's will, the will of the Lord and the will of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Atma, the Shiva. In the case of Narada, in the case of Roma Dash, Narada also at the age of five because of mentioned that Narada's mother passed away by the snake bite. It was mentioned that it was the will of the Lord, it's a will of the providence. Yeah. And then uh, Narada Dev could go to the forest and meditate and then could uh, receive the mercy of the Lord. Whereas on the Dhrumaraj case, here it is considered as Dhrumaraj, other determination, and it happened, this incident happened. It was the, the will, the free will of Dhrumaraj that took that determination, or karma, that just came on the karma. So in this two scenarios of the free will, of that individual, as in the Narada says, the, free, the will of the Lord. So, when we compare this to the will of the Lord, as well as the free will of the individual, so how do we think that, uh, you know, is it that uh, the Narada says it is the will of the Providence, that why that will of the Providence happened here, and in this case we say it is not the will of the Providence, but it will of the, uh, you know, the individual choice or the determination of the Dhruva Maharaj. Well, that's, a, that's I, I would edit what you said, if I may, and keep it simple. There's our will, and connected with our will is some effort, prayasa, effort, endeavor. And then there's mercy. And the consummation of anything requires both, even material, what to speak of spiritual. So you're making a contrast that's incomplete. Narada in his previous life made an endeavor and it was met with mercy. Dhruva made an endeavor and it was met with mercy. Now the motivation and the consciousness behind Narada's previous life's effort and Dhruva's life's effort was different. The motivation was different, one accepting, the other not accepting. But the, both had made an effort and both are met with mercy. You know, the complexion is different, but the, the elements are the same. And for us, both are required, effort and mercy. That's the lesson. Is that all right? Okay, Devaki, you want to say something about this? No, uh, it's a little comment. Um, it's really wonderful to see the consoling lesson um, from Nipi's perspective. Um, I hear very clearly that in Pacific listening you mentioned a few times. Uh, and Sunniti is very honest and um, humble. Oh. And I, I, I see that humility especially when she says about that millions of mothers like me will not benefit you what Krishna, Vishnu, shelter can benefit you. So I was thinking that's a wonderful lesson for all of us as parents, as gurus, counselors, that we, in our discussion with our, our uh, counselees, uh, we don't portray ourselves as counselor gurus, we portray Krishna as the we were just small little uh, uh, piece of that uh, and that brings trust between us and the other person. Yep. Very beautiful, it's like very clear in my mind now. Thank you. She is an instrument. 
She's not unclear about what her function is. She has all faith. Her heart is pure, she has all faith. She understands her son. She wants well wishing for him. She is accepting of her misfortune and she's not grieving about her misfortune. She's just accepting it. I'm over here instead of in the palace because that's from birth that was written on my forehead. I mean, that's Vishwanath's commentary, but I'm accepting. There's nothing I can do. I can't go to Uttanapada and plead on your behalf. He doesn't care about me. There's nothing I can do. So, but I'm your mother and I, you're, I have, you know, I have feelings for your feelings and I have my own feelings. So we need a strategy. And so, yeah, in, in counseling their principles, it being the instrument Let's say, you know, aside from counselor, just being a friend. Your best friend or friends are those who remind you of Krishna, however they do that. They may do so many things. They may put their arm, arm around you and they may bring prasadam and they may, you know, do stuff that just kind of like human nature things, holistic kind of things. And they remind you of Krishna. So to be a best friend, you do all kinds of things for other people and you're always at the center is reminding them of Krishna. That's being a, another's friend. That's the real standard of friendship or counseling or mentoring or parenting or this thing or that thing. And you can't give it if you don't have it. So you're an instrument of that will. Now it's almost 12 o'clock. How are we doing with time? There's some questions, hands up on the ladies' side. I see two hands. Where's the microphone? Could you bring the microphone? Put your hand up a little taller. Here it is, microphone. Thank you so much. Um, on one of the slides, it was stated that acceptance of our current spiritual position brings um, when I introspect about where I am in my spiritual journey and where I ultimately would like to be. You would like to do what? When I introspect <coughs> where I'm currently in on my spiritual journey and compare that to where I would like to be ultimately. Okay. I feel more a sense of complacency than of humility. Um, how can I... Frustration instead of humility? Complacency. Complacency. Whoa, really? Because you feel it's so far away, you feel complacent? Mm -hmm. So how can I acknowledge my current position and also feel tangibly inspired to keep moving forward? Well, One response, not the response, but a response is take that expression you just expressed and introspect, look inside and ask the question, what's really important to me? Not, you know, what's going to get me an A in my exam on my Bhakti Shastri course? But what's really important to me? And if you are, if, as you become clear what's really important to you, then because it's important to you, you can take steps towards that which is important to you. Whatever that is. You can have some, you know, doable, proximate, reachable, something that's important to you. And, it can, that can, then, and it's good to align that with something that's like, you know, an ultimate what's important to you. 
in the course of my life, you know, one of the things they say for goal setting and value development is when you're at the last stage of your life and you're looking back at your life or they're reading your obituaries at your funeral, <laughs> what would I like them to say? You know, that's what, you know, worldly people say. So, you know, that's what's, not just, that's ego, but you know, what, what I would like my life to, to be at the end of the conveyor belt. And it can be really simple. It doesn't have to be lofty. I'd like to know who I really am. Besides the roles and the expectations of myself and other people, I'd like to know who I, so, or something. And I'm not there yet, but it, I really like, to, you know, I don't I, say it negative. For me, I don't want to be at the end of conveyor belt and I still don't know. That was, you know, 50 years ago in college. No thanks. I want to know. Not get it, you know, give the right answer when it asked. But no. That's important to me. And then you fill that in. There's other things that go along with knowing who you are, but keep it simple. And, and what's important to you? So that takes away complacency, because that is uh, using Viktor Frankl's language, a purpose that's awaiting for you to fulfill. That's more of an intermediate goal, but not necessarily even a spiritual goal. But that can take away complacency. Because you're energized by that which is important to you. And you're aligning things, although you have things that are, you know, not necessarily like your favorite stuff, but you're aligning those things to this higher purpose and goal and mission, attainment. Okay, I see three hands. Go ahead. Then you can pass it on to her in front of you. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, seeing as Suvaki is a causes of reaction towards Guru Maharaj, so why did the Lord create these negative emotions? Why is the Lord doing what? Lord create negative emotions like uh, pride, anger, and Why does he create the bad stuff? Yes. People want it. He doesn't want it. That's Vaikuntha. That's that place he wants. But some people don't want it. So how can uh, one total like, these negative emotions into like in the service of the Lord? Like pride and envy. You. Pride and envy. Not somebody out there but you, right? Yes. Okay. Well, if you're um, a transcendentalist, then you can dovetail, like Prabhupada's explanation, I'm proud to be a devotee of the Lord. I'm proud to be counted amongst those who are at the feet of Krishna trying to serve Krishna. Now, that can be notional and not at all transcendental just plain old pride, a groupism. Shishi Radha Shah Sandra Kijay. But the, the transcendental position, putting in simple terms, something that Prabhupada taught is, I, I am proud to be counted amongst those who are at Krishna's feet serving Krishna. I take, because the pride goes to Krishna and being connected to Krishna, that's my pride. Then it spiritualizes that tendency. That's its proper repose place. Now, as far as envy, that again is a transcendental thing. If you remember from the Prahlad Maharaj description, 
when the, the four Kumaras went to the gates of Vaikuntha and they were prevented from entering by Jain Vijay, they said to Jain Vijay, you have no place in Vaikuntha because this is the place where the personality of Godhead resides. And um, they referred to him as the one who has dvesha towards Marari, or Madhu Sutana, Madhu Dvisha, that's it, Madhu Dvisha. So Madhu Dvisha refers to the Supreme Lord, Narayan and Vaikuntha, who has dvesha towards the demon Madhu. Remember that? So then I told the story. Prabhupada named one of his disciples Madhudvisha. So later Madhudvisha, GBC in Australia, asked Prabhupada, what's the meaning of my name? And Madhu refers to the demon Madhu and Dvisha means the Lord was envious of Madhu. And Madhudvisha said, how can he be envious? And Prabhupada said, because in the spiritual world everything is there, but it's pure. So, we're not pure. So we can't dovetail envy unless and until we're pure. Because we'll get tangled in, you know, doo-doo. <laughs> Bad stuff. So, we hold that aside, that tendency, and look towards the higher consciousness tendency to being in service of Madhudvisha, because he can you know, kill Madhu and not like Madhu. And that's just fine because he's his transcendental. And as so we direct ourselves towards the Supreme Lord and the material side of envy dissipates just like everything that's impure becomes dissipated by the Supreme Pure. That's now Naratam Das Thakur in his writings, you're familiar says these six enemies, they have their place in the life of a Vaishnava. I can't recall his explanation of where envy has its place. I'm only re recalling what Prabhupada said about the Supreme Lord who is, it has transcendental envy. If somebody can remember what Naratam Das Thakur says about Devo a pure devotee engaging envy in Krishna's service, you can please raise your hand. But so, some explanation. But that's for people that are pure in heart. And we're not yet. Someday. So then we can follow Naratam's instruction. Okay. Right in front of you. Who? Sunil. Yeah. Yeah. So do we know uh, her uh, spiritual master or we don't know anything? We don't know. We don't know. But she, she, we don't know. But she knows of Brahma and Swayambhuva Manu. So perhaps, there's no information. Perhaps she heard from Swayambhuva Manu. Because Swayambhuva Manu is her husband's father and he's one of the 12 Mahajans. So maybe she received bhakti from him. We don't know, doesn't say. Uh, second point is uh, uh, regarding Narad Muni, when you mentioned, you explained the Kalagya, uh, you said that the uh, super soul in others' heart maybe gave that information to Narad Muni. Yes. I'm not that very clear that looks or seems contradictory. Why? Well, because then he is not free Kalakya. He doesn't know. Not why? He doesn't know that. Well, excuse me, but why? Because super soul is the source of knowledge. Right? Yeah. 
Sarvashachahamridi Sani Vishto Mataksma. So he's situated in the heart. And for Suprasol to give knowledge to Narada Muni about past, present, and future, he's not restricted to doing it this way only, is he? He can give knowledge to Narada Muni however he likes. Isn't it? Why is he restricted? Because I can't understand. He's restricted because I can't understand. He can give knowledge to Narada Muni however he likes. And that the explanation I gave from Prabhupada was one who knows Krishna becomes the knower of all things, are you omniscient? And Prabhupada's answer was, I, I know what I need to know to serve Krishna. Krishna gives that understanding. And that uh, what he needs to know can come from within his heart or from some outside source. But that even that outside source is through super soul. There's not only one door in the house. Does your house have more than one door? No? There's only one door in your house? Okay. He's not restricted because I can't conceive other than. He can give however he likes to give. And he can change the channel like that and give it from within his heart instead of through somebody. But through somebody is through somebody else's heart. It's the same super soul in their heart and his heart. However, he wants. He, maybe he wants to give some service to somebody, so he has somebody do something. So they get to, they just, however he likes, no problem. Yes, in the back. We'll get, this will be our last question, we're gonna end. determined we should be that to serve Krishna even though uh, some, some situation come and then they demotivate us then we should be determined. Thank you for that. And then my question is like uh, as you uh, said like it's a previous karma that causes us a situation. So it gives a little impression of how whether to a uh, was going through because of his previous life. So I just want to clear myself like it's, it's he had something wrong in his previous life. So he's grow, going through because he usually we say something wrong goes because it's our previous karma. So I just want to make myself clear that. Well, it can be a combination of two things. One, what Narda is saying and what his mother is saying is some previous lifetime misfortune has come because of your previous lifetime. Another option is also possible at the same time and that is that the Supreme Lord wants to engage Dhruva in the way that he wants to engage Dhruva for their relationship and for our edification, both and one doesn't have to cancel the other. For one thing, many purposes can be served. That's one of the qualities of Krishna. Okay? That, you have a second question or that's it? Okay. You have a question? Okay, last question. Oh, somebody wrote something down. They, I want to make sure I get through question. Go ahead. The question is from the morning topic that we asked. This morning's topic. Yeah, that we asked for such a response. So when we want to do a response, uh, and till we find the solution, sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes time. So That's wise. Patience. 
No, no, patience, mode of goodness. You, when you, as you cultivate goodness, you learn to distance yourself from that net anger emotion. Patience doesn't require you forget it. Patience requires patience. So, the circumstance is there, the emotion is there, and you're patient. Now, what sustains patience? That's nectar of instruction. Your confidence in Krishna. No, the, you, you, you have to, uh, you, my advice is, the, the, the big picture is my advice. The big picture, by that it means, there's life, and life is not this one thing. Life is the, the big picture. This is an important part of the big picture, but it's just part of the big picture. And life goes on. And there's, Thising and thatting and the other thing and duties and responsibilities and roles and life. Now I don't that doesn't require that I forget this one thing. But if I obsess about this one thing, it becomes bigger than life. And that's not life. Life is the big picture. So even if you see a quick solution, it may be advisable to not do it because it, it, you, you just transit quickly into the obsession and the doership I'm going to fix the problem mentality that's false ego Krishna doesn't like that and we want to please Krishna not just like fix the problem because I'm, I'm obsessing about it so patience is sometimes good it's wholesome. Because then I can just rely on Krishna, not on, you know, my s smart plan, my strategy to deal with this thing. Easier said than done, but it's a mode of goodness at, combined with relying upon Krishna. Let's take Suniti, like Supermom. She felt, she saw, she saw her son, she knew the whole situation, Uttanapada, Sunasti, the whole thing. She didn't obsess. She wanted a solution. She didn't see a solution. While her son was gone in the forest, she was praying to Vishnu every day, probably many times, certainly multiple times during the day, for the protection of her son. And her son came back, protected and perfected. Because, of, you know, that's what Vishnu does. He reciprocates with those who take shelter of him. She knew that. She had all faith in that. So, Something that you can try to strengthen is your faith in Krishna. Because <clears throat> that will give you the patience needed to not be obsessive about the thing that hurts. He'll be your protector more than a million moms or a million good ideas to deal with that thing that's like hurts. Okay, no, I, 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 um, gosh, how can I say no? I'll say yes, and then, then that, but that's it. No more, nobody raise, raise your hand. Take the microphone over there. And then I want to remind you of the, the little exercises we're, we, I'm requesting of you. You gotta speak into the microphone, that'll help. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj, for uh, many questions answered which are clearing our minds. But uh, I have a 
simple question or tough question, I don't know. How do we understand what is Krishna Bhakti and Krishna Prema? And if it is same, why it has to be called as Prema and Bhakti? Is Bhakti is done with fear or it's the same? Well, it doesn't have to be called anything. Is that all right? It doesn't have to be. Why does it have to be called? In my answer, it doesn't have to be called anything. But bhakti means something and prema means something. So it's, the name is appropriate for what it's identifying. Bhakti means two things. What your senses do and what your mind does. Bhagavad Gita. The senses are engaged in the objects of the senses with an offering of those objects of the senses and your senses for the pleasure of Krishna. That's bhakti. And there's something the mind does. It goes to Krishna. That's, that's what bhakti is. It's called bhakti because that's what it is. And prema is just the mature stage of bhakti. And bhakti has the power to dissolve the, the subtle body. What? This, it's the subtle body that carries us from lifetime to the next body to the next body. The gross body is gone, but the subtle body isn't gone. It carries us to the next to next. And it's bhakti alone that can dissolve the subtle body. Then you no longer require a gross body. Because the subtle body is dissolved. And the subtle body is where we have false ego, material intelligence and the material mind that's reading things wrongly. And it's dissolved. And that's at the prema stage. It gets dissipated in the practicing stage, gets closer in the bhava stage and is dissolved in the prema stage. So th there's names be because it's just appropriate for the stages and, and the process itself. So now I'm being reminded for the third time somebody has a written question and I'll t answer it. Try. Um, the first question. This is the Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a bad person but he did some good things. So Henry Ford was a supporter of Hitler, racism, and benefited greatly doing business with Nazi Germany before and even during World War II. So that's the example of if someone is brilliant in one way but does something immoral, are we still supposed to accept, quote, worship him or are his achievements completely negated by his bad actions? Well, depends on who you are. If you're Jiva Goswami, then you can take gold from the filthy place. Or truth is truth regardless of the source of that truth. That's a Jiva Goswami principle. He takes gold from a filthy place. He puts in his sandarbhas things that are from people that we wouldn't quote because they're impersonalists and other things like that. But when there's truth, he takes the truth concisely stated without having to restate it because it's truth concisely stated. Now we don't have to like the bad behavior of these other things but you don't trash the person and everything connected with the person because there's a bad things. It's just like you know for example just like Suruchi. She, she, what she said and did was nasty but she said something that was gold. And Suniti is a Paramahamsa. She takes the gold. We don't trash Suruchi and everything that's connected with Suruchi. She has to, she pays the consequence for her nastiness. She repents her nastiness and even repenting her nastiness for which Dhruva and Suniti don't hold her accountable. Krishna does and she has some consequence for her offense. But it's not because they're ill-wishing against her. It's between her and Krishna. 
each of us are responsible for our, our choices and our conduct. Okay, so now if we do some transgression and later we acknowledge it and go back to the devotee to ask for forgiveness, but our apology is not accepted, what to do next? And um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in Madhurya Kadambani gives the answer. You pause and after some time you go back again. And if it's still the apology isn't accepted, you pause and you show your sincerity and you go back again. And if it, you do that a number of times and it's still not accepted, then you take shelter of the holy name. But then it's not an offense against the holy name because you've genuinely, sincerely sought forgiveness of the person who you have offended. Then, according to Vishwanath, that's not an offense. You just move on. That is, b between you and, and Krishna, you've done your part to amend the offense, the transgression. Okay, so now, they're, they're a reminder, a request. And I don't know what else is in the schedule here, but um, it's now 12.25, gosh. What? Okay, this is the third of the exercises. So if you like having that same little group that you had before, that's nice. If you want another group, that's nice. But discuss um, how, there's three things. Acceptance, and were this principle of acceptance to be applied in principle in your life, it can help you can take a specific situation if you like, but it can help sustain balance in both your internal and external devotional life. You can go, you know, I, I'm, I haven't been accepting, and if I were to accept, this would be helpful and balance my spiritual life. Another reminder was some situation when you felt there was some specific reciprocation with Prabhupada or your spiritual master where you felt accepted even you had kind of messed up you were just there was acceptance from them and then the third was you had this other discussion exercise and if you didn't finish it you could continue it is it clear any questions yes Your, what you do with your family and the community, and then what you do with your mind. That's the internal. The mood of bhakti and how you orient and direct your mood of bhakti internally. When you have your hand in your bead bag or you're standing at the ki you know, in the kitchen at the, when you're moving about. Internal. Okay. More? You're okay. So I, I'm still not understanding. Uh, so, so balance and equality between these two. No, no, within yourself, within yourself, I'd like to be a balanced individual, and in my dealings with my, let's say for you, your family members, I'd like to be a balanced person. or the community, or whatever the circle you want, you know, the interpersonal dynamic of your life. I like to be, have balance and have equanimity within myself in my dealings with others and my internal life. Okay. Um, take as long as you like. 
There's no bell going to be rung at the end. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, one 